Um, for our fourth and last forum before the uh, general election, which will be Tuesday, November 6, I believe it is, at the right date there, uh, I'd like to welcome you here and to also give a, a thank you and a shout out to the Albany County Public Library who helps to set up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that Susan Simpson's out front, she will be videotaping, so this will be posted on the Albany County Library's website, and the tapes from the previous three forums are also on the website, so if you want to catch up on the other candidates, feel free to view those. Um, on the back, well, before we get started with questions from the candidates, I, I'm going to go over some general information. Um, on the back wall over here on the side wall are maps with, that have the districts and precincts on them and also sample ballots for the election. So if you're uncertain about where you're voting, check out the maps there. Um, and if you want to get a visual of what your ballot's going to look like, you can take um, figure out which is your ballot by where you're voting, the precincts and your districts. And also on the back table are some brochures regarding the league, including membership brochures, should you be interested in becoming a member of the league. There are also our pro-con flyers on our other ballot issues. So not only in this election do we vote for candidates for various offices, we have some other um, citizen issues that are being voted on. There are two local tax issues, the Albany County Transit Services Tax and the Albany County Economic Development Tax. We are also voting on three constitutional amendments. And we, like I said, there are some brochures describing those um, ballot issues and giving some pro-con information about them. In addition, there um, is a judicial retention that affects us here. Um, we are in the, I believe it's the second judicial district, and the judge out of Carbon County, Judge Wade Waldrup, is up for retention. And there is some information that's put out by, give me a help. Yeah. The Wyoming State Bar. Okay, about, about the retention. Um, and that if candidates brought any information, that's also on the back table as well. Um, the general election, like I said, will be November 6th. The polls are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Or you can vote early by completing a ballot at the county clerk's office or requesting an absentee ballot from the clerk's office, and they will mail those to you, and you can either hand deliver them back to them or mail them back to them. Um, there's general election information that you can obtain off the Albany County Clerk's website or the Wyoming Secretary of State's website. And if you need those web links, I've got them here with me. In addition, the League again has put out or will be putting out their voter guide. It, uh, it's being published by the Boomerang. It will be in this Sunday's edition. Oh, you've got the, uh, Susan, you want to hold that up? She's got a little flyer there that has all the websites on there if you want those to pick up. Um, so this Sunday, the voter guide will be published in the Boomerang. It's also already on the League's website. So if you go to the State of Wyoming League, there's a link to the, I think it's a link to our, our League and then a link to the voter guide. There's the voter guide right there. I looked at it once, now I've forgotten. Wyoming LWV? Yeah. And then you find the Laramie and click on it. And click on that, and that'll give you the voter guide. Um, uh, at this time, I'd like to give an opportunity for any other candidates who are here tonight to stand up and briefly introduce themselves if they'd like. Okay. My name is Matthew Blaylock. I'm running for City Council in Ward 1. I'm Becky Riley, and I'm running for City Council in Ward 3. Okay, thank you. Nancy? Uh -huh. I'm not a candidate, but I want to introduce uh, Peggy McCracken. I'm Sue Ibera. We are part of the newly formed GATE PAC, a political action committee that is in support of the half mill levy for transportation in Laramie. So we brought some literature that's back, uh, over here on the table for you to look at. And if you have any questions, you can contact us and there's information about that. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to begin tonight's forum with questions for the candidates. Your questions are to be written down and submitted at any time during the forum. You can, uh, there should be pencils and pads of paper at the end rows of the seats. When you have your question written down, just raise your hand up with the question and someone from the league will collect those and present them to the moderator. Um, 
the question should be directed to the school board candidate in general, not to a specific candidate. Um, and we do have a timekeeper, Carly Ann. She will sign, candidates have 90 <laughs> seconds to respond, and each question will be asked of each candidate. And the timekeeper will give some signals. You have a, I think it's a 30, 60, and a, and a stop at 90 there. Um, the last 20 or 30 minutes, <coughs> excuse me, the last 20, 30 minutes of the forum, we will turn over to informal co conversation <coughs> with, the, with the audience. If it's running, you know, if we're out of questions before that, we'll certainly end sooner than that. Um, and we're going to ask that the candidates use the microphone, and I'm looking around, because we're usually in the library. I'm not as familiar with the sound system. Do I have the lone microphone? Okay. So we'll have, you'll have to pass this one around between you over there. And now I'm going to turn things over to Amy Williamson. She will be our moderator tonight. She is the state league president and also the treasurer for our local league here. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome, everyone. I always make this little spiel before the league does anything. The League of Women Voters, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a grassroots political organization. We are completely nonpartisan. We neither support nor oppose political parties or individual candidates. And I've got a bunch of questions here. I think we're going to allow 90 seconds for the answers. And um, Carly is timing when she flashes the red sign. I don't know what we'll do if you don't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think of something. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I would also just remind you briefly, as you recall, there was the uh, legislature engaged in redistricting. So you may be voting in a different place from your polling place of the last 10 years. And you can familiarize yourself with the maps on the wall where you will be voting. You can contact county clerk's elections clerk. And um, you also would have received in the mail a card from the county clerk giving you your new district and your ward for city council purposes. So bear that information in mind before you happily show up at something that used to be your polling place and is now closed. We've got questions on all kinds of topics here. It's, let's see. All right. I think we'll do with the first one. It's kind of a, it's kind of been a little bit in the news lately. And I think we will start um, at this end with uh, Mary Thorsness this time. Um, was it wise for the school district to choose the Turner Tract as location of the new high school? This takes a valuable piece of property, taxable property, um, to be used for a non-taxable entity, depriving the city of needed revenues. Please explain. I think from the perspective of the school district, certainly the Turner Tract is an excellent choice. Um, we looked at a number of different properties and it quickly rose to the top, both from the perspective of uh, usability for uh, building a new school and access, I think, in a lot of ways. Also had plenty of space to put a full-service high school in place uh, with adequate parking and all the things that a high school needs. Um, from the tax perspective, I know that the city, um, we worked with the city carefully and that they were uh, in favor of this sale, and so I assume that they don't feel that it's too big of a problem, um, and I hope that it isn't. I also felt that that was a good option. I would have liked to see more conversation with LEDC, though, to maybe switch the 9th to 15th uh, section uh, north of town that's being built for the information data centers. I think if we could switch, that might be a little bit better so the high school is closer to where it's at now. Um, and it's closer to town there rather than so far out. However, I did not oppose where it was placed. I thought it was a big open space, allows for more growth, and I do believe they're planning on hopefully building an elementary school out there too, and maybe making an education complex, so I agree with it. Um, we really did feel, as a school district, that that was a good place to put it. We had looked at the northern spot that you were talking about, 
and we were worried about the high voltage power lines that were there and children being under there um, a lot of their day. And we also looked at areas that might have had the aquifer under it and nobody wanted to do it there. We also felt that this was a good place to put the high school because it's close to the um, Laramie Community College and some kids actually take college courses up there and it makes it very easy for them to get there instead of having to drive much further. So we really thought this was a really nice place and easy to get to partly too because that's where the city is thinking it's going to be building more houses and things like that. So there will be more families there and it'll make it easier for kids to go to school there. Well, I'm going to reiterate what's already been said. You know, the school district, we looked at areas uh, in West Laramie, uh, the northern part of Laramie, and the south part of Laramie. And uh, like Mary said, this quickly rose to the top of all of our choices. You know, we needed a piece of land <clears throat> that would support the high school, and this one fits perfectly. And like uh, Jason said, possibly we're going to put a new uh, elementary school there as well. You know, the tax, the tax um, issue, I didn't even think about, to be quite honest with you, but since the uh, school district worked uh, hand in hand with the city, I assumed that they were not going to have any issues with that. And, it, you know, they, it, it's a nice area, and I believe it's going to be a great uh, area for the um, high school, and it's going to be a great area for growth around that, that, that entire area. So I believe it was, uh, out of all the choices we had, the best one. I too think that the location that they selected for the new high school is a really good choice and with the possibility of a building an additional elementary school up in that area there's certainly enough room for both facilities. Um, it does have good access for the students and for traffic control so I think it is a good choice. This is hilarious. <laughs> if you all would, if you if you can think of it, you might uh, say your names as you begin your answer, just in case people aren't connecting the sign behind you with the person sitting there. For the sake, for the sake of our, our non-studio audience, okay. Um, <clears throat> what will be our school district's greatest challenges in getting a new high school built? and how will you work to overcome them? And I think we will start down with Trish Penny this time. The high school that um, the school board and the school districts are trying to present, it's a really nice facility. It's a facility that's going to meet our current needs and also some future needs so that we have room for growth. I think the largest challenge is getting the support for a bond issue that's going to have to come up because the state will fund about 75% of the school and so there'll be another 25% that we're hoping that the community will support. Again, I have to reiterate, oh I'm sorry, I'm Lawrence Perea. Uh, I have to reiterate what Trish just said that one of the biggest, uh, uh, not such necessary barriers or obstacles, but one of the biggest things that we're going to have to overcome is a getting support from the community for the bond issue. Um, we will have money from the state, however, uh, that money is not going to build a high school that's gonna take us to the next 50 or 60 years. You know, we need that extra money to build a high school that's gonna be a world-class high school. It's gonna be able to be flexible, and it's gonna be able to adapt to the upcoming changes in education that uh, hopefully this community will accept. But I believe that uh, the school board, the school district, is going to work hand in hand <clears throat> with the community coalition to help um, gain support in the community for that bond. I also think that uh, the bond issue is going to be the most important thing. And I do feel that it's very important that the bond issue passes because otherwise we would have things like a football field with no stadium around it. And, uh, if the bond issue does pass, we will have extra science classrooms and things like that. I feel that having these places for kids throughout the school gives each child a place in the school. Um, not every child is a, is a science person. Um, some children are football or swimming or you know sports type people. And if we have all of these areas for our kids, I feel that we will be a better community and we will have 
more involvement of kids in the school. I'm Jason Satcombe. I too think the bond issue is the biggest one. Um, I do recall a couple weeks ago seeing a survey in the Boomerang where they polled the public about uh, if they were in support of the new high school, and I was surprised to see only 51%, I believe, were in favor of it. So I think getting public opinion and getting the rest of Laramie and the district behind this is very important in addition to the bond issue. Um, just because like everyone has said, we want to make a world-class high school here. We want to make sure students feel that they have a place to go, that they're not excluded in anything like that. Um, the swimmers have a place to go, the science uh, people have a place to go, um, and that it's pretty much there. I lost what I was going to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Mary Thorsness. Um, I want to start by saying that we're really lucky in Wyoming in that the state does fund the vast majority of uh, new school buildings. They'll cover 75% of our new school. And that will give us a very good academic environment for our students. Um, we want to add to that 75% and, and uh, expand common areas, expand the arts areas, expand athletic facilities, and expand uh, science and production labs so that our kids have access to everything that they want to do at that high school. We want to have a stadium and not just a football field. We want to have a pool where we can hold meets. We want to have science labs that are integrated with production labs so we have fantastic uh, science and technology education. And, and I think that passing the bond issue is, is really a, a very important thing in order for us to be able to have all of those things. And, and I hope that we can build the support in the community to do that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think we'll go from the <clears throat> excuse me the uh, question of the new high school to um, a question about the recreation mill. The school recreation mill is currently committed. Would you favor committing this mill for updated sports facilities at the junior high school? And uh, I think we'll start <coughs> with um, Mr. Perea and come this way and then back to Ms. Penny. You know, the, the, re the school recreation mill is already committed and that's, uh, uh, I say funds that I would, I would not want to touch right now. I believe that um, uh, in order to get the world-class high school that we want for our students and for the future students of, of Laramie, know that the bond issue is, is going to be the way to go because that's going to be uh, one of the ways, the most simple way that we're going to be able to raise the amount of money that's going to be needed in order to get the uh, facilities that will make the high school what we want it to be. We're going to Trish. I'm sorry. I was going to just say ditto, but I don't think that worked. Um, <laughs> um, no, I, I do agree with Lawrence. I really think the that needs to stay there for the kids at the rec center and you know doing things in the community with that and that's not enough money to do the things that we need to do with the high school um, it wouldn't even come close to doing that so I think that money is doing a lot of good where it is and I don't think we should move it. Jason Setko, I too agree that we shouldn't uh, mess with that um, we need to have everything kind of centrally located for students um, so that there isn't much vehicle traffic going around, especially since the Turner track is slightly isolated right now. There'd be a lot of students going on uh, just built roads like that. We don't need them traveling back and forth. So having everything out there within reach, within walking distance, is the best thing uh, for the high school students. So I served on the uh, recreation board that distributes the rec mill levy uh, to uh, school district, city, and county entities that apply for that money. And I am awed every time we go through that process at how many different groups we're able to support with that rec mill levy. And I am uh, loathe to shift that money um, too far away from those many projects. That said, I think the question also addressed uh, the junior high, and if, if I think the junior high had specific projects that they wanted to fund using that mill levy. They could certainly apply and the rec board would consider them and, and that might be one way to improve things uh, in, in the athletic facilities at the junior high. I 
and Trish Penny, I also would like to see the money remain where it's, where it's at. I think for a brand new high school, I think it's better to have all of your facilities and buildings and all the recreation areas and all the athletic areas all in one location. Again, to minimize the amount that the students are traveling, um, I think it's just as better just to keep it all in one location. Thank you very much. I have two um, questions here that relate to um, <clears throat> school nutrition. And one of them is, please discuss the quality of school lunch and breakfast, but I'd like to combine that with um, consideration of your approach to changing food selections to bear in mind local availability and programs to educate and encourage students in healthy eating. And we will start this time with Ms. Penny and proceed this way. I know that new, this is Trish Penny. I knew that new federal regulations came out to address the lunch issues and trying to um, develop a menu plan and a food source that would hopefully eliminate some problems with obesity and, and health issues. Um, I know that every new program that comes into effect is going to have some issues and some concerns and some situations that you're going to have to work out. Um, I have not personally had a chance to eat at any of the schools yet to know what actually is being served there. Um, I am on a committee right now to look at providing perhaps some local food to the schools. And so I'm just beginning to do my research into that right now. You know, ch childhood obesity is a, is a major health concern in the United States. And uh, the federal government, they try to implement um, guidelines to have children eat better. And I believe that this school district works with Sodexo in providing those healthy options. However, it's my understanding that when those healthy options are provided in line, children don't necessarily take them. So it's not necessarily a um, school district problem. It is a kind of a community, uh, not necessarily a problem, but it, there should be some community involvement as well. And I believe, you know, what you said about bringing in uh, locally grown food would be some way that you can involve children in the community. However, it, it's, it's a comprehensive, multidisciplinary kind of um, attack on making kids, or not making kids, but encouraging kids to eat better. Because it's something that, you know, they may eat better at school. We don't know if that's going to happen at home. And, you know, the habits that they carry at home, they're going to carry to school. So it's just something that, you know, I'm glad that Trish is working on something about research and, and getting locally grown food in because it's something that it's not going to go, go, any, go away anytime soon. And I believe it's something that actually can be solved with the appropriate amount of work. Um, I, I have been working on the lunch committee, and so we do work with Sodexo a lot. And I know it's been really hard for them, too, the last, you know, since the federal um, mandates of changing the lunch program, because, like Lauren said, they are trying to help kids who are obese not eat so much but eat more healthy. But the thing is, so many kids really are very active, and they're doing things after school, football, basketball, track, or those types of things. And so they really do need more food. So we have been looking at ways to be able to get them more food and still follow the program that is set out for us. Um, Trish and I have been working also with the schools. We just put in, um, a few years ago, Trish put in raised beds, and the kids were raising vegetables in there. And this last summer, we put in three greenhouses so that they were also raising vegetables in the greenhouses. And I was really excited to see kids excited about, of all things, vegetables. And so I know that if they are out there and we get them excited about these things, that they will eat them and they will just love them. Um, I had also talked to Acres up at the university, and the only problem with, with that is by the time school starts, their stuff is already dying because it's getting cold. And by the time they start up again, um, 
you know, we're out of school. So, but they are looking at ways to have a longer growing season so that maybe they could be incorporated into the schools too. Like everyone, uh, I think we've all seen the gardens that are taking place at several elementary schools. Um, the only drawback with that is our growing season is pretty short here with Laramie, um, with the winter setting in, the cold temperatures setting in early, and possibly starting late. One thing that I do know has worked really well is Slade Elementary currently does a program where students get one fruit and one vegetable each week. And all the teachers require is that they at least try it. They don't have to eat the whole thing, but they at least have to try it. And they get a wide range of things to try. I believe they tried cactus one time, uh, himica. I know a lot of stuff that I certainly would not try myself. Um, so I'm surprised that they tossed that in there. But they have common things in there. And with kindergarten and first grade, it helps build that knowledge and gets kids excited about trying new things and implements that in there. Uh, the only other thing that I will say is we do have to keep a fine balance with nutrition because if we offer too much nutrition, too many vegetables, some kids will be turned off by that and might not eat at all. Um, so it definitely is a careful balance we have to play with keeping nutrition but also making sure we're not going overboard on that. Um, I think the fresh fruits and vegetable program, even if it's only a couple days a week, is a really good one. It's present in all the schools, not just Slade. And I, I, I know my son, a junior high student who is loath to grab fruit out of the bowl at home, tells me every day he grabs an apple at school. So it, it's getting to kids, you know. Um, and I, I think it's important to just keep exposing kids to healthy food as often as we can, um, whether it's through fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables or through the lunches that they're served. Um, we also want them to be something kids like. And this year, I think, with the new federal mandates about uh, the calorie count and content of meals, that's been a little bit more of a challenge, but we're working on making sure that the meals are something kids enjoy as well as that are good for kids. Um, one constant challenge is the fact that uh, our school lunch program, like virtually every school lunch program in the state, runs a deficit and it's expensive to buy fresh local foods. Um, but we, we do what we can. We are happy to support our school lunch program through the general fund so that our kids do get healthy meals every day. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We're going to go to a um, different topic now. Um, the next question is, what role should schools, the school board, uh, and the superintendent play in communicating with parents? And I think we'll start with Mr. Satkunam, go down and come back to Ms. Thorsness. I think this is a very, very important issue. Um, there seems to be a or at times is a big disconnect between parents and educators. Um, some parents don't have the time with full-time jobs and whatnot. Um, I know we still have the same parent-teacher conferences that occur in the fall um, that I believe are just going on now, but there needs to be a lot more. I believe they're setting up websites for individual teachers and classrooms. Um, that will help also uh, allow parents to better talk with the teacher, better connect with them. Um, but I know it is a very serious issue. We do need to work on building more direct communication between the parents, the teacher, the principal, and the superintendent. The school district is working on our website, and each school, I think Christmas, is going to have a website of their own. And on these websites, Jason is right, that, that the teachers will have their own website so they can talk back and forth with parents, parents can send emails to the teachers, see what, what the kids are studying that specific day in their classroom, what their homework is, and, and just almost everything. It was amazing to see everything that was on there. Um, I would like to, to always have parents know that teachers are open for them to talk to whenever they need to. If they have a concern in the classroom, parents should be talking to their teachers. and. School board members, too, are there to help guide them in who to talk to if they need to talk to somebody. But communication is, is very, very important. This is Lawrence Pree again. I would have to uh, say that communication is really important for a lot of different reasons, and there's a lot of different communication. Jason and Julie have already talked about the web page. However, I'm going to talk about uh, the superintendent communicating with the public and the school board communicating with the public. You know, as, school, as elected officials on the school board, um, 
it's my opinion that I answer to my constituents who got who put me in this position if I were to get reelected. So as a school board trustee, I am always open to hear what my constituents have to say. Now, as a school board trustee, I also know that there are processes in place for people to uh, voice their complaints, their legitimate complaints with a teacher, a principal, or another administrator in the school district. And if I feel like that is the way that they need to go, I will, I will uh, let them know that's the process. But I think that communication, open communication with the school board is very, very important. Open communication with me is really important. Um, I believe the superintendent, you know, he also has uh, a lot of work to do. However, I believe that when a superintendent is contacted by a, a parent or a teacher or anybody that has anything to do with the school district, um, I believe that the superintendent should respond in kind as well. I'm Trish Penny. Um, I really believe that the education is a collaborative responsibility of both the home, school, and community. <coughs> and so, I, as a school board, if I were to be elected as a school board member, I would want to be there for the parents, the teachers, or the students to be able to contact me and discuss any issues that they might have. Um, I think our superintendent and our teachers and our administration, when I've had to deal with them, they've had a very open door policy. I've been able to uh, talk to them direct, get my concerns out, and they've been very knowledgeable and very helpful to getting issues resolved. So I think it's just a matter of getting the parents and the students uh, just more comfortable in approaching the school and the rest of us, and we're there to help you. I'm Mary Thorsness, and I reiterate that I think communication between parents and, and students and their teachers and administrators is really important. I'm really excited by uh, the new web pages that are starting to roll out. I think that that will really help people uh, connect with their school a lot more. You know, in the era when virtually every parent, it seems, is walking around with a smartphone in their hand, they can look and see what their kid's homework is while, you know, they're waiting at the dentist and that kind of thing. I think that's going to be a really valuable resource. And I hope that we as a board can update our web page to keep the public more informed of what we're doing as well uh, as, as we move forward with that. Uh, again, I think it is, uh, there is often a hurdle for parents to speak to people when they have a concern, but I do think everyone in our district is willing to listen and, and help resolve their problem, and I hope that parents take advantage of that. Thank you. <clears throat> There's a question here about the school bus transportation. How can routes be established so that children have shorter commutes? Yeah. My young child rides for 50 to 60 minutes in Laramie. I think we'll start with uh, Ms. Radosevich, go to Ms. Penny, and come back this way. Okay, I'm going to say that that's something that I've always heard about and, and asked about. We um, did put in place a um, computer program this year, and I'm not actually sure, to be very honest, if it is completely in place. Um, but one of the concerns is they try to pick them up as close as possible to their homes and have areas so that the children aren't walking, you know, out in the weather as much. But I, I, I apologize. I haven't heard.